Hey everybody, thanks for joining us for this video. Instead of doing a lot of yakking, I've got a real interesting guy on the line here and I'm just gonna wind him up and turn him loose. The last two videos, I've included one of or two of his stories. If you'll go back and listen, uh, they're stories sent from Eddie in Georgia and he's got apparently vast experience with these things on his property and he's studying what's going on around the country. And uh, Eddie, how you doing? I'm doing fine, Cal. How are you? Doing good. Um, Eddie's sick. He's he's come down with a sinus infection or something, and he's still uh, doing this recording with me, so I appreciate you doing that. Well, I'm, I apologize for my voice. I know I, it's, it sounds like I'm in a barrel to me. I don't know what I sound like to you guys. Oh, it sounds beautiful. Yeah. Just You could sing a song, man, and we'd be happy. <laughs> I, I doubt that. I doubt that, seriously. <laughs> Well, tell us, uh, now you're in Georgia and you've got, yes, sir. tell us uh, a little bit about your, your hunting. Is it a hunting lease you have or is it property? No, sir. It actually belongs to my, my, my boss and it's, it's a place we take, we, we've taken clients there for 30, I've been there 33 years and I've been taking clients. It's just a good place to take and it's been quality time. And over the years I've became really friends with them as opposed to just business acquaintances we've we've experienced a lot of things together and anyone that's listened to those two videos you did those were folks that i take hunting and and that, that was just something that happened and and then really the first time i experienced was that animal i saw in Cullowee, north carolina visiting my girlfriend in college i didn't know what it was uh the only contrast i had was a family in my hometown had a given eight. It to me, the length of the arms and the frame around the face, it just looked like a very big version of that animal. Just filled out a good little bit better. I mean, I had to come up with a rational reason why I'm seeing an ape in a tree on a mountain in North Carolina. That made no sense at all. I didn't anticipate that and, and honestly it had it not whistled, I'd walk right under. I, I, it, it would have been to my right, but I was. It, it was basically almost at my twelve o'clock. It was. It was. It was at one on one, but I would have walked under it. I'd have never seen it if it hadn't whistled. You know, I've, I've listened to enough to know that during the day they will put sentries out to warn the group. And there's some dummy like me walking in the woods, and I, I think perhaps I may have caught him napping. I have no idea, but he let me get way too close because the whistle. As I said in the, in, the, in the what I wrote, it was the first part of a bob white. You know, when you're raised in the South, you anticipate the, the white part coming out, not just the bob. Right. And in that case, it was a, the high pitch of the, and I'm not a good whistler, but it was a bob white. It just didn't finish, and it was so close, I couldn't help but look directly at where it came from. I was looking dead at a face. And I just went, went up the tree. And there he was. He was hanging on to the to the center of the tree, and his right arm was on the limb above. And he was trying to keep the center of the tree between us. I, I could clearly see that, but when, when I moved my left to check for a tail, I knew it couldn't be a monkey. It was too big, but I had to check. I was a, a senior in college, fixing to be an employed, hopefully productive citizen. My thought, that's why I never said anything about it. I didn't need to be trying to get a job in the real world and people thinking, well, this guy's nuts. He's seeing things in trees. So right. I never said a word about it. And actually, I never said anything until I, I told my oldest friend. I mean, we were literally raised together. And he was, uh, by then, he, we both had kids. And he looked at his son and they both rolled their eyes and I, I quit talking. You know, and, and honestly, if, if I hadn't seen it, I don't know if I'd believe me because it's not, it's not normal. We both raised, he hunted, I hunted. I was raised in the woods, a little place south of my hometown, and still got land there. And I never saw anything like that. I heard I heard my, my relatives, my aunts, my granny and all, they'd be in here full of dark. The book would get you. But quite frankly, I, you know, I just thought that was something they told us. I never saw one, and I was as deep in the woods as you could go and stay on, stay on the property that my uncle owned. It, it, it got very interesting to me after after I realized, you know, I, I listened to a few things and uh, 
you know, listen to, you know, Tim Baker and those guys talk. And uh, I, I said, well, here's some guys from the South like me, and they, they've they seen them too. And, and that their, their stories were credible. So it, it helped me in my mind rationalize what I had saw. And then after I ended my, my what I went to college to do, I was a coach and a teacher, and um, I started taking clients hunting. I would take clients to the tree. Back then, we were, you know, in the business world, we're real safety conscious, and we bought the best stands we could buy to make sure no one got hurt and nobody fell out. It had safety bars and straps. And I would have to go out early and loosen the turn buckle before the season started, make sure the tree hadn't grown into it and didn't have vines and you know, things blocking their view. And when I was out there alone, I would hear things. You know, you, you will make an excuse for voices. You'll make an excuse for loud noises. I can remember one morning I took everybody to the stand, and that was back when I'd actually sit. And I got in my stand, and I had no longer, I hadn't been in that stand five minutes. I heard a conversation back toward where I parked my truck. Now, this truck is parked on 2,100 acres, and it's the only vehicle on the place. You know, my inclination was somebody's walked in here. I've got poachers. I got down out of the tree and I went. Of course, I never found any anybody. But it was distinctly a conversation. Someone gave instruction and somebody acknowledged. There, wasn't no, there was no doubt about it. it was a conversation. But it was not a... I just thought my hearing was so poor I couldn't understand it. I, I didn't realize I was listening to an entirely different language. That was an instance, and there was another occasion, same thing. I just got in my tree, and it sounded like someone threw a coke machine out of the top of a 60-foot oak. I heard it come through the tree limbs, and when it hit the ground, I literally felt the impact via the stand being stuck in the ground. That's how much of an impact it was. What was it? What were they throwing? They, they weren't throwing anything. I'm convinced now because that coke machine ran off. Okay, and I felt it run off. I just assumed from the impact of the footsteps that it jumped out of a tree from a pretty good height. Now, what made it do that? I don't know. I have no idea because um, I didn't have. I I, I was pretty uh, conscientious about knowing where my people were. Hopefully, not on the ground. I, I I didn't want them shooting on the ground. I wanted them shooting from you know down, so the impact of the bullet would be in the ground. After years of, of taking them hunting, I got comfortable that they knew what they were doing. They weren't going to hurt each other. They weren't going to kill one another. So, you know, I relaxed all the, 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 the little rules I'd put on them um, because I was confident no one was going to get hurt. They actually knew what they were doing. That was basically how I came to know there was something out there. And it, it oftentimes... I never, it wasn't like the the, the time in in, in North Carolina when I actually had a visual eye-to-eye with one. I never had that. It was always something in my peripheral, some noise, some movement, or it was something that was there and it was no longer there. Like one morning, I took people to to their stand. My truck pulled up. My headlights were dead on a stump. It looked like an old, burned-out, lightning-struck half stump at an angle. It, it, it was gnarly, like it had moss on it, nothing to it. I cut the truck off, took them to the stand, came back out. Well, by then, I'd quit sitting. I, I, I didn't hunt anymore, personally. I'd go back to the cabin, make coffee, and wait, and then go retrieve them at a designated time. When I cranked the truck up and the high beams came on, I just sat there and looked because the stump was gone. It wasn't there no more. Now, I know stumps don't walk. So, obviously, what I <laughs> what I call as a stump, one the stump. That's something else. They they have a, and I say they, it, it, this, this animal has an ability to turn into what you want it to be, like a stump. Right. If they turn around and squat down, you will not see an animal. You'll see a stump where you'll see something that's natural in the forest. You will not. Like a water brush or something or something like that. Exactly. But the only reason I knew anything was it was in the dead center of my headlights. And then when I cranked the truck back up, it was gone. 
and stumps don't run off, just like Coke machines don't run off. But that's what it sounded like <laughs> when it came down out of that tree. It's an interesting subject. It really is. Now, so, you've uh, you've you've become familiar with at least the – you think it's the alpha in on this property. Well, I've always, I always called him Big George because when I'd come check stands by myself, I'd always hear a call. That's what it sounded like. You know, like you, you would hear on, on National Geographic, for example, you would hear of a, a gorilla or a big chimp. And it, 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 that's what it sounds like, a call to me. I'd always speak and say, hey, big guy, I'm here. It's just me. And, you know, I never saw anything. I just, I just assumed it was him letting me know that, you know, I'm here. I know it's you. No problem. But that that was kind of an inside joke for me and him, I guess, because I never, I never actually had a visual on him. I, I did see movement from one tree to the next in my peripheral at times. I never had a reason to be scared, you know, other than the the, the turkey hunting experience I shared with your, your readers. Now that did scare me because I knew it was big and I knew it was close and I knew. I was not that big, and what I was holding was not big enough. I gave strong consideration just to breaking and running and leaving my bucket, but I didn't. I sat there. I don't know. Uh, well, just kind of re- kind of rehash the whole story in case somebody hadn't heard it just real briefly. Well, I, I was I was turkey hunting, and um, I was a, a really a novice hunter. Had gotten into that kind of late in life, and had a friend that was just crazy about it, and he was real good at. It. And he had gone with me a couple of times. The only turkey I'd ever killed, he had called for. That morning, he couldn't go hunting. Because I called and asked, you want to go hunting? And he said, no, I can't go. He had something else going on. But he had given me a little uh, push-button hen call, a decoy, the same one I'd used the first time I killed a turkey. And the decoy, literally half of it would uh, fall off most of the time. It was all I had, so... I, I parked my truck, and I was doing it kind of like deer hunting. I wanted to be four daybreak and let everything settle down. I walked in. It was between third and a half mile. The truck to the tree. The tree was not far from my personal deer stand. It had some very large roots at the base. This tree was seven, eight feet wide at the base. I don't know, 250, 300-year-old oak tree. It's been there way before I got here. Anyway, my dove bucket would literally fit in the, uh, the, the the two roots, you know, coming down out of the tree. And I could recess back up in the tree, kind of a concave. And uh, I just thought that was a cool way to be camouflaged. So I set my decoy and got on my bucket. And it was still, it was just breaking daylight. And I sat there. And one thing Keith had taught me was don't go crazy with the call. Just do it as light as you can. They have great hearing. But if they see you, they're not coming. So I, I was sitting still, recessed in the tree. I was being very conscious of being, you know, unseen. And I'd heard several gobblers come down off the roost. They were 100, 150 yards away. They make a good little bit of noise when they fly down. And I knew they were on the ground. So I, by then, the sun had been up 15, 20 minutes. It was, it was, the sun was coming up around 7, 7, 10, something like that. And it, I figured it, I didn't have a watch on. I figured it was probably about 7.30 when I heard what I thought was the, the, the gobblers coming off the roost. So I hit my little button a couple of times. You know, uh, uh, just trying to get somebody to, to answer me. I didn't get an answer, but I heard a, a good little bit of fuss coming from behind me from the direction of the river. Whatever it was was not trying to be quiet. And uh, I had thought about it being, you know, maybe it's, couple of deer, maybe a, a bunch of hogs. I'm, I'm pretty pretty conscious about pretty conscious about hogs because my mother had a great uncle. This is a story she told me when I was little about being in the woods and being being avoiding hogs or wild feral hogs because he he had either fell in the pen, cut himself, they smelled blood, or had a heart attack. But anyway, they ate him up and they found his glass frame, his belt buckle, and. They would say that was pretty impressionable on the little boy. Ooh, and man. It was pretty, pretty impressionable on the old, old guy sitting in a, on a bucket that's under a tree. I, was, I didn't I didn't want to get walked on, on by a bunch of hogs. Because I'd already had this, the sows 
you know, you walk on the south with some pigs, she's not what you want to be around. No. Nope. I mean, I already had to drop the hammer on one for that reason. I, you know, you don't want to shoot them when they got little ones. But uh, I didn't want to get eaten by a hoss. So I was listening very intently. And, and whatever this was was coming. It wasn't trying to hide the fact it was coming. And it seemed pretty intent on my big tree I was under or the general direction. Now, this thing was 75, 80 yards back. I could tell by the sound. And the river was probably 100 yards behind. So I finally concluded this is not a deer. This is not something on four legs at all. It's got two legs. and It's, it's got a, 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 a beeline on this tree. So I was sitting there listening, and um, it, it came. It kept coming, and uh, I got to notice how heavy and how long the stride was between the steps. And I, I got a little concerned, but, you know, I was sitting there holding the 12 gauge with no, no, didn't, didn't have, I had five in it. They were three inch magnums, number four shot. So I figured, ain't much going to take this from close range. I should be okay. But the closer it got, the more impact those footballs made. I got real uncomfortable. You know, when they got within 30 or 40 feet of the tree, I could tell this was a, a large individual. As it got to the back of the tree, now they're still, they're still 10, 15 feet between us because that tree was enormous. I smelled, and it, and it smelled a lot like uh, body odor. It smelled like something I'd smelled growing up. You know, I'm in Georgia and middle Georgia anyway, you don't smell what heat would do to people perspiring. Right. <laughs> and, and, uh, he's, and I use the <clears throat> expression of 12 well, peach pickers, but it could have been anybody loading hay. Right. If you're out there sweating in July sun in Georgia, you're not going to smell very good. No. And, and this rascal, he had a strong smell to him and had a little bit of a, a wet dog tinge to it. And when he, when he, when he blew air, a friend of mine, she had a Belgian draft horse and, uh, I'd heard that thing exhale many times. And only something that weighs a lot can make that much noise just exhaling. And that's when I got, I really got scared. I, I realized that this thing's enormous. I, I, I almost broke run. I didn't broke, broke run. I just sat there. You know, all kind of rabbits run over my grave. My hair was standing up. I was tingling. I was almost I don't know how to describe it. I was almost feeling dizzy because I, it, it, it took him 10 minutes to get to me. I listened to this for a long time, and I had the option of breaking and running when it was still 100 yards from me, and I didn't do it. Now, of course, I was regretting that. At that moment, I, was, I wish I just got my bucket and went to my truck, but I, I didn't know. I didn't know that it was a poacher, <clears throat> somebody trespassing, but I was pretty sure it wasn't the person. At that point in time, then the smell went away, and I was trying to smell, and the sound there was no sound at all. There was just no sound, no other sound, no no birds, no squirrels, no no armadillos over there nosing around in the leaves like it did earlier. So I didn't know what to do. Uh, he made so much noise coming to me, and then all of a sudden it got dead quiet. You know, I had a choice: I can break and run, or I can just sit here. I didn't figure this animal knew I was there. If I hadn't made any noise, I was completely recessed. The only way he'd known I was there was smell me. And I, I didn't have a, I, I didn't spray my boots down or anything like that, like I do deer hunting, because I was turkey hunting. I didn't think that was a necessary thing. So I sat there, and I sat there a good little bit. I figured I sat there between 30 and 45 minutes. Well, after that amount of time, I didn't hear anything. I didn't smell anything. It, it couldn't have climbed that tree. It was just too dead gum wide at the base, and there wasn't a limb for a long time. After, after a bit, I, I stood up, grabbed my bucket, and I started walking. I didn't even look back. Uh, if it's going to get me, it's going to get me anyway. I had my gun in one hand and my bucket in the other, and I walked pretty fast. And I was headed toward my truck, and I didn't look back till I was out from under the last limb. I made sure if there was something in that tree coming down on me, I wasn't going to know it until it was over. I looked back, I didn't see nothing. I never broke stride. I kept walking. I got all the way to track, <laughs> all the way to the truck, I'm sorry. And my watch was hanging on the gear shift. I looked at my watch, and it was quarter 11, 1045. And I, I thought, 
I thought my watch was wrong. I said, there ain't no way. There ain't no way it's this late. But then, you know, I cranked up. I got to the gate and I left. Got home. It's about a 20-minute ride back to the house. And it was 11.30, quarter to 12 when I got home. So I was just, uh, uh, that kind of blew me away. I didn't know. I, I hate to get all wooey and say I lost time or something strange like that. But something went on. So that, I just didn't feel like I sat there that long. I was scared. I admit I was scared. Well, that's what I said in the video that <clears throat> it sounded like you had a lost time, but you know, I don't, you don't know. And therefore I don't know, but I'm curious. I would have, my impulse would be to stand up, turn around and look behind that tree. But, you, but did you, had you had experience with these things before that? So you felt, well, I, well, I, you know, I'd heard things. Right. I didn't see anything. I, I, I'd had the experience of hearing the conversation, hearing the Coke machine hit the ground and run off. I'd had the experience of seeing the stump there and not there. But the actual experience of having something that big walk up on you and knowing it's that close, I wasn't really wanting to see this thing. Well, uh, that's why, don't get me wrong, I, everybody's going to do something different, and I have no idea what I would do. I, I, it's perfectly understandable you didn't want to turn around, but go on, go on with well, it. Well, if I turned around, I would have had to get up and walk a good five or six of my steps to have seen behind this tree. I, you, I, it's hard to describe a tree as big as this one was. Wind finally got it. Matter of fact, it's still out there. It's a root ball now. The wind got it. It didn't have a, the block it used to have. Right. It's sad, but it's just a big root ball now. But I bet the root ball's 20 feet. It's it's huge. It after it, it it made the exhale, and it was it had the Belgian draft Clydesdale exhale. I realized this was a very large animal. I didn't feel like I wanted to be you know seven eight feet from this thing, or whatever it was. But once it went quiet, I didn't know what to do. I mean, I don't know how you shut off smell. I don't know how you can make that much noise, and then all of a sudden, all that just stopped. I was kind of hesitant to even say this. I feel more comfortable talking about the kids laughing because I had two people with me. You know, Jordan and VJ was there. So, you know, I don't feel as, you know, take my word for this type thing like I did. You know, on this occasion, I was right by myself. When I was in Colorway, I was by myself. When I have two guys with me, my brother was with me one time down in Florida going fishing. And we had a, a, a cat run across the road in front of us. It was two thirty, three o'clock in the morning. We were uh, flat fishing, trout, red fish, and we were just trying to get to the camp before daylight and, you know, be the first boat out of the creek. Back then, I was just addicted to flat fishing. I couldn't, I couldn't do any. I couldn't hunt anymore. I couldn't do anything. I used to <laughs> like that. I, I had one. I was a one track mind. I had a nineteen foot skiff behind me. You were eating up was, with it, weren't you? <laughs> yeah, I was. I really was. And this was a, a two-lane state road, not very wide, and, and I mean nothing on it. When you make that turn and cut over to a little place called Shady Grove, you probably run 20 miles, and you don't see anything. It's just, you know, the national forest on both sides of the road. And this cat run across the road, and he wasn't 20 feet in front of the truck. Plus, I probably wasn't going 45 miles. Now, I was in no hurry. You know, my, my deadline was day, daylight, so... I was in no hurry. Me and G was talking. It ran across the road in front of us. And then it turned right when it reached the other shoulder and ran in my headlights for probably seven, eight, nine seconds. So I got a good look at it. Now, this was a Jaguar. There was no doubt in my mind. The pattern was just as clear as if it had been the yellow version of the black pattern. Right. But this one was solid black. But those headlights, the way it was shining on it, it was it was almost like it, like a regular Jaguar. The the spot pattern was so obvious. But what really shocked me was the size. My head would have looked like a navel orange in its mouth. I mean, it it was enormous. And they say a, a Jaguar won't go over two two fifty in weight. Well, I'm an old football coach. I, Muscle mass or something, I gauge pretty good. This thing was huge. I'm, I'm sure walking up on a nine foot booger in the woods is scary, which I've never experienced that. But 
I would not have wanted to walk on this thing because it was, and it was all boy. Now I was looking at the east end of a westbound cat, and every time that tail come up, no doubt it was it was all boy. That that blew me away, knowing something like that could be in those woods. And your brother saw it too. Oh yeah, yeah. That's the reason I don't have any problem telling this story. <laughs> I had a guy sitting in, the, and my brother was sitting right in the truck with me. We both saw it. It was it was enormous. You know, we talked about, uh, you told me that story the other day, and I mentioned that uh, what you thought about maybe an exotic animal keeper turning one loose or something like that, they're not usually not black. That's a panther from South America. That's where those things are. But I've, I've heard quite a few people have, have told me they've seen them from deer stands, but none of them said they were that big. I had a conversation uh, last week with a friend of mine over in West Tennessee who I used to work with, and we hunted together forever. I moved away, and we still get together every once in a while, but he's he's always, he would hear, we'd hear stories like that, and I'd say, hey, did you hear about a cat, you know, in Madison County or Chester County or Hardeman County? He'd say, oh, that's all a bunch of bull. I talked to him last week. He got one on a trail cam, and he called the TWRA, and told them about but, it and they told him that they do not exist in Tennessee, but he's got a picture. He goes, I'll send you a picture of it. And they will, they don't even want to look at it. it it's crazy. Yeah. And, and that, that kind of makes you wonder why there's such a violent and a, for lack of a better word, a violent reaction. You know, I don't cotton to somebody calling me a liar. You know, that's the reason I was always has to tell the story and tell the way because I was by myself. But when you got people with you and they can corroborate what you're saying, that kind of makes it a different situation. You know, I, I, you get interested and you listen to people talk about occurrences that, that happen to them and someone gets hurt or someone has a video or someone is shoots one at point blank range with a 12 gauge with, with a slug. I, I heard one and it hadn't been terribly long ago. It might have been six, eight months ago where a guy shot one. His wife called him from work. The cows were up in the corner of the pen to knock the fence down. She must have called him half a dozen times at work. He finally got off work, come home, called the neighbor. Said, we got a coyote problem. My cows are tearing the fence down. He had a dozen head of cows, and they were grouped up in probably a 20 by 20 corner of the fence when he got home. So whatever it was, they were scared of so he gets his neighbor. They get in a, a side to side. One of those souped up ones, not like a golf cart, what I was using. Uh, one of those things run 50 miles an hour, but they went down in the woods and it was dark. And he looks up on the left bank of the, the road they're riding on, and there stood a thing that definitely does not exist except in the movies, a band, one, one of those, one of those werewolf movies or something. And his neighbor shoots it point blank with a slug. Oh my blows, gosh. The pectoral, blows the pectoral muscle, slap, just explodes. And they and they do a, a 180, and they're going out of there as fast as that thing will carry them. And he looks up, and the thing is running side to side, almost sticking his head in the door. Oh, my gosh. And then, it, and then he says, it reached down, and he could tell where his hand was because it was dimming his headlight. It was slowing the vehicle down. And his neighbor, who had the shotgun, had done short stroke that gun and had a shell jam. He finally got that shell unjammed and stuck the muzzle of that gun across his face because he was driving. And when that thing saw that gun barrel come out, it backed off. But then he had the call the game warden. Game warden come out. Lo and behold, uh, he told him, you're going to get a visit. And sure enough, the next day, his, his, his land's covered up with folks that he don't know in unmarked vehicles. Every trail cam he had, he had about 14 trail cams on his property. He was a deer hunter. Like every SIM card he had out there was gone. You know, he, he, he had all kind of trouble, you know, subliminal threats and such. And I don't know. I don't understand that part of it. There must be something that they're not telling us, obviously. It's, it's bad enough that you see something like that, but then the folks are supposed to do something about it, behave in a manner that I don't know. I, I don't. I don't even want to interject anything there, but there, there's something to this that we don't know. Yeah. I'll just say that. And the people that show up, 
I, I did uh, said some about it. I think one or two videos back about some people out west, kind of they're almost being harassed by some of these people. Mm-hmm. But, but it's because they've told other people or reported it to you know who they would think are the proper authorities, and it just mm-hmm. causes problems for them. All, the, the people don't come to help; they 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 just cause more and more problems for them. I think people are getting reluctant to to report these things and especially unless unless you're somebody like me i'm a little more educated now but i mean a couple of years ago if i'd have seen something like that i'd have called the game warden right away oh yeah but i don't know yeah, if i, I would know. now i don't know if i would hey those uh those two the two bj and uh what was his uh daddy's name jordan jordan, jordan was the son right and bj was his daddy no no they they were just uh um uh, related at that time, Jordan had gotten old enough to come by himself. His dad had quit filming. Okay, but you know, I, I was, I was just taking family members hunting. Now they but got it, it, they got roared at and screamed at, and I'm wondering, did they still hunt with y'all down there? Yeah. Oh yeah, they they came this November, and we and we did a little walk about. A lot of timber's been cut down, so it hadn't. It's not quite the same as it was. If, if that 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 night we heard the uh, the kids laughing. There was no way I was going to say anything. I mean, that's just too far out. It's one o'clock in the morning. We in a swamp. There ain't no way there's kids in that bottle. And then Jordan said, "Did you hear those kids?" And I, all I could think to say was, "Thank you," because I thought I'd lost my mind. It's bad enough I just got walked around by something to come out of that bottle, but to think there were children down there that that was just way too far out there. And as, as soon as y'all hit that call, I mean, it was almost instantaneous. I, I, that's if, if I, if I had tied the, the thing off and left it down there, they, I mean, I, if I, I'd been one of them, I said, how did you do this? And I didn't do nothing. I just went to a spot. I thought this has the right kind of topography. It's got a low, you know, I, I, I have studied enough to know they like to roll a little bit. They don't like to get skyline. They don't like to, they want stuff behind. They don't want to be they're They're smart enough to see. And then if you do see them, they can turn into a damn storm. It just makes you wonder, you know, I, I listened to a, a story about two guys fishing in a, in a reservoir in, in, in Ohio. There was splash by their little John boat They're fishing in a 14 foot John boat using a trolling motor, no less. The guy in the bow of the boat, they were cousins. He said, take me up there. I'm fixing to whoop this so-and-so's butt. And that's not exactly what he said, but yep. something to that effect. He said, I just saw him duck back behind the tree. He's throwing rocks at us. So he pulls up there and guy gets out. So he picks up a rock and throws it back. Well, lo and behold, it wasn't a person. What come out behind that tree was a big, hairy, very unhappy guy. And he come up there and hit him, knocked him into the boat, broke two ribs, knocked him out, busted his face open was gone in a millisecond. It all it all happened so fast. The guy in the back of the boat, he just pulled him back into the bow of the boat, half in, half out. He assumed he was gone because he disarmed. He took his pistol and the pistol he was carrying, and, and it went on for several minutes. But they finally got out, and he dragged him on into the boat. He was bleeding real bad. They got back to the, to the, to the launch and called the police or sheriff's department. They came out, and then those guys got treated like they'd stole something. It just seems to be a constant. If someone gets hurt, someone has, you know, credible video or something, that they're treated very unkind, let's just say that. I, that It just makes you wonder, what, what in the world, why would they do that? You know, that brings up a topic that's dear to my heart. You know, a lot of the ridicule that people have – is from people in this Bigfoot believing community. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not. That's one. I'm of the, not a member. Of that. No, I'm not either. I'm not a member of any group. I told you that the other day, and I'm. Uh, you told me about one experience you had, and I've had a similar sure. one, and it's. Uh, I think it's shameful that people will come forward with pictures or videos or whatever. Now, some of them are, are a little. They may know what's in the video, but and they may have seen it moving, but everybody else can't see it. 
but they don't. Right. They don't. Right. It doesn't rate that kind of ridicule, in my opinion. I mean, we're all in, in you know, a strange it, way in this together, and uh, so you're right. I mean, uh, people, what difference does it make who was the first person that saw him take it? <laughs> yeah, bathroom. It don't matter. It don't matter. It's just a hairy man in the woods. It's interesting. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm just amazed that that uh, that people can behave the way they do at times over there. I mean, if, if someone knows what it is, they should tell us. I don't know what it is. I, I know I've never felt threatened other than the turkey hunting, and then, and I'm quite sure whatever was behind that tree could have hurt me if they wanted to, and they didn't. Now, they might have done something else that gave them opportunity to go away. You know, I've always wondered that, why the noise stopped, why the smell stopped. So we mean you have signposts. I don't think neither one of them stopped. I think my little thinker part quit working uh, is what I think. That's uh, interesting. I, well, you, it, what else could it be? I mean, I smelled it very strongly. I heard it very vividly. And then all of a sudden, no smell and no, I think I'm there 30 minutes and I'm there two hours. In that in that in that period of time, whatever it was left, but I didn't hear it leave. I sure didn't hear it come. That's just I don't know. I'll I don't tell wanna... you. I tell you what I think. <clears throat> I think uh, you say you don't know what they are, and I don't know what I they are. Folks, some kind of folks. I do. I have... well, you and I and everybody. I've never had an experience, but uh, I would include myself. You and I and thousands of other people know just as much about them as the self-proclaimed experts do because there's no, they don't, there's not enough evidence to make a determination on any, not anything, not any, a guy sent me some pictures of some tracks today that I think are fabulous. And that that's one of the best pieces of evidence. You know, it's. It's hard to fake you know those. It's easy to fake well, them, but it's hard to fake this, them with, uh, you know, the foot lines and the sole of your feet and well, all. You can't, you can't fake that unless it's a real thing. No, and and the place that I'm talking about where I take these people hunting, it's probably not 45, 50 miles as crow flies from where the Elkins Creek cast was cast, and 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 that's the one that they set the standard by. Because it has the dermal ridges or the fingerprints, that's what I call them, and the distinguishing what makes it an animal. So that is not a question: Does this thing exist? I'm, I've seen it, so I know it exists, but I don't know what it is, where it came from. But I've I've done some reading. I'm fairly well educated. The the the, 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 the crossbreeding between the human and the Neanderthals of the the thing that starts with a D that I probably would mispronounce, the denizens or whatever they call them, uh, the Heidelberg dude from Europe, all those. And any time you crossbreed something, it doesn't matter what you're crossbreeding. If you crossbreed a lion with a type, you're going to get a bigger animal than what you started with. It's going to be bigger than either of the parents. If you breed a male tiger to a female lion or a male lion to a female tiger, the liger it's going to be bigger than either of them. I remember when when my daughter was little, uh, a gentleman was kind enough to give us tickets and backstage passes to the Shrine Circus. So I got to take my little three-year-old to the Shrine Circus and go back to where the animals were. They had an 814-pound Siberian tiger. Now, 814 pounds is a lot of cat. And had it right there on the cage. I didn't, I didn't doubt it for a minute because his paw, it bigger than both my hands, both my feet put together. The thing was enormous. It also had a, about a 500 pound male African lion, which is normal size. I didn't realize tigers got that big, but it was a Siberian, which is the largest of the, the tigers. It also had a, 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 a male leopard and a male jaguar. Now, when they were sitting on their little pedestals, everybody was growling and snarling at the other one except the, the jaguar when nobody talking to him because it just looked like a more primitive animal to me. I mean, like, nobody snarled and, and swatted at him. They, the leopard was swatting at the lion and the lion was swatting at the tiger and vice versa. But that, that, that jaguar, they let him alone. There's a reason that, it, well, there's a reason it's got the, the highest jaw pressure of any of the four big cats and they were all represented right there on the little pedestals. 
It's just the more primitive of the four cats, in my opinion. And you, you see them together, and you'll realize that this is a different cat. It's just, I know it's a new world cat, but it's, it's different. You know, a lot of they talk about howling monkeys. That's a new world monkey. A lot of people say they hear that in the woods. Now, I haven't heard that personally. I'll tell you what we did do one night. <laughs> the same two guys and I went down there and uh, we found an area, I called myself Getting Smarter, where I could park the golf cart and we could see what was coming. I didn't want to get in thick woods or thick brush and get in a position where I couldn't see what was coming because we were fixing to hit on some trees and do some stuff we probably shouldn't have been doing. Well, BJ had him a, a good old Louisville slugger, and he he walked over there and walked this little old oak tree, and he hadn't drawn the bat back, and it wasn't 50 feet. Wow! All of a sudden, he was running – he was running left. He was running right. I said, where are you going to go? I mean, there's nowhere to go. You don't get that golf cart. You think we're going to outrun him on the golf cart? I said, we should as well stand here. Well, there ain't nowhere to go. I mean, it, it was obvious something answered that, and I mean, it was real close. Like, we didn't see it. We didn't see anything. Nothing made a vocalization. We didn't. But that response was instant, and it was close. But it was it was kind of fun. You know the thing about these wood knocks is, <clears throat> I, I grew up in the city, but I've spent so much time in the woods that I've gotten really used to them. I mean, I'm 57 right. years old now, and probably for the last well, I mean, since I was a teenager, I've always been traipsing off in the woods doing something, and I love to hunt by myself. You never hear that wood knocking from anything in the woods it's it's just there's nothing out there that can do that unless it's a human whacking a pine tree with a louisville slugger that's that's the only thing it could be or something with an arm that can grab a stick and whack the side of a tree trunk with with its arm Uh, (laughs) there's there's just no other way to explain those things And, and again who knows what it is but we think we know what it is I, they're, to me, it's just folks. It's got to be some kind of people. It's, I don't think there's a, I don't think there's an animal smart enough to stay away from us as well as they do without them being somewhat like us. And I, and I remember I had a conversation with someone a long time ago. Well, it hadn't been that terribly long ago. I said, those things may have evolved, but we were created. If we had evolved, we'd have better feet. We'd have better appendages. We'd have better fingers, better better elbows and knees. They've got all that. They've got everything we don't have. Uh, you know, I don't want to get off on the religious tab, but there's no doubt. We're, in my mind, we will create. And even my, my college biology professor, bless his heart, he said there was no such thing as macroevolution. He said there's a lot of microevolution, that everything will adapt to its environment as far as a big bang and uh, a, 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 a paramecium and now we're splitting the atom I, no i don't i don't think that for one millisecond no i heard a guy say one time he was a big mega evolution believer until he looked at his daughter's ear it, it's such a perfect little organ that he knew yeah. he knew there had to be intelligent design behind it we're almost to an hour. You've given us, uh, I know you've given me a lot of things to think about. You you think about things in logical ways, and I appreciate that. Is there anything else you could share with us that you think people would want to know? Well, I, just just keep your eyes and ears open if you, if you get in the woods, because there's, there's obviously more than this subject in the woods. I, and, and I hate to keep going back to what I've heard and I did listen to a, a story about a guy down in Sarasota who had gotten an older employee a job over at the state park and it's kind of well known there it's, 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 it's east of Sarasota thick with alligators and cotton mouse and every other critter that's this this in Florida he, he was his dad owned a uh, basically a trash company they, they hauled off um, household refuse to a landfill 
And when, when the guy got old enough to retire, he took his retirement, but he needs a little extra income, so he got him a job. And they had known him all his life since he was a little boy. And the, the older guy called him and said, I want you to come out here and let me let me show you something I'm seeing. So he humored him, and he, he, he asked him, so what night you want to do this? He said, oh, no, I don't want to do this at night. I don't want to be out here at nighttime, not with this thing. He said, well, when do you want to do it? He said, just come out here about 10, 30, 11 o'clock. Well, I usually see him around lunchtime when I mention the cans in the, in the park. So they, he goes out there, and he humors him, and they're sitting there, and there's a Hispanic family. They're having a birthday party for a child, and the child got one of those, whatever you call it, hanging in a tree. They're hitting it with a stick, and candy's coming out, and they're giggling and running. Everybody's having a big time. And then all of a sudden, the guy punches him. There he is. And he looks, and sure enough, there this thing is. And it's got its full and undivided attention on those little kids. So he's got his, you know, his iPhone in his hand. So he puts it on record. He said, I'm, I'm 75 feet. I got it full zoom. I got this thing dead right. And and I was really concerned that he was, it was going to do something to one of those children. He said, I was just before open the truck door because this wasn't, this wasn't a normal book. This is one of those dog men type things. And by that time, two vehicles come by. And they go down the road, do a 180, and come right back to him. And one of them gets out, it's a female and a male. The male comes over to his, his side of the truck and said, I need your phone. Because he, they went by, he was videoing at the time, and they knew what he had on that video. They took his phone. Said, you can pick it up at the ranger station on the way out. So, you know, they had a few words. and But he, he was satisfied he really did work for the government in some capacity. But then um, he went by, picked up his phone. When they left, and then, of course, the lady that was in the other vehicle, she had a, lack of a better term, like one of those glass, like something you would listen, but it was emitting a tone. And his dog was in the back seat, and whatever this thing was emitting, it was killing that dog. I mean, it was squalling and putting his paws over his ears. And, and, and he actually told him, said, whatever you're doing, stop it. You're killing my dog. And so the lady shut it off, but the animal that they were pointing it at had left. And those kids were safe. But then he got out of the park. He, he, he started thinking about it. He pulled over the side of the road. His SIM card was going out of his phone. All his contacts were gone. His work was bidding underground utility. He looked at his laptop. It was washed clean. There was nothing on that laptop at all. That's a perfect example of whatever this is, it, it's not supposed to be. It's not supposed to be recorded or it's not supposed to be known. Even if you do know it, it, that's kind of bizarre. Well, I'll tell you what, they're doing a good job keeping it under wraps. I mean, well, I, if, if that's the intention, I guess so. But I just, you, you hear it six and seven and eight times, different people hadn't talked to each other. I don't know. I would just say, folks, going in the woods, don't go unarmed. <laughs> I, I tell my little brother that all the time. I know he goes stomping all the time without nothing. I think, you know, it won't take one time. You wish you had something, just a discouragement. Yeah, so. I've uh, I've spent a little bit of time telling people, and maybe this is bad advice, but I, you know, I walk back here. I've got five hundred acres behind me. I don't own it, but my neighbor does, and he says, "Just you do whatever you want back there." And and uh, I ride my bike, take my dogs. I go on night walks back there, just me sometimes with the dogs. I never think about a thing. I never worry about anything. I just enjoy the outdoors. And I've told people, just because you hear these stories, don't be afraid to go enjoy nature. Yeah. But I, maybe that's bad advice. Well, hey, I've been in them when I was a little fellow, since, since I was a little fellow. And I never thought about it. Nothing come up and tried to eat me. I didn't I didn't think any more about it when I saw the thing in Cuddle Leaf. But one thing I, I will share with you, the first time I ever listened to any stories about this particular subject, I was listening to uh, Tim Baker, Kumbo, talk, and he, he was telling the story about his granddaddy on their farm, and his granddaddy called these things catamounts. And, I, and, and when he said that, that kind of just, it was almost like somebody threw cold water on me because Western Carolina State University mascot is a catamount. I was thinking well, that's odd. You know, when he asked what it is, he said it's 
part bear, part cat, and, and part monkey. And then I was thinking, well, yeah, that might cover cover everything. <laughs> but um, those guys with the outlaws, they have a long history with these things, and yeah. Um, but I just thought, I just thought that was that was a heck of a coincidence. I was at Western Carolina State University when I saw the, really the first one I ever saw, and their mascot was a catamount. And the first time I ever listened to anybody talk about it, his granddad called him a catamount. Right. <laughs> I don't know. We're uh we got about a minute to go before we're at an hour and I'm gonna we go past an hour nobody's gonna listen to me and you. Yeah, so. I'm surprised anybody does listen to me. I'm, <laughs> I don't sound like I'm in a drum. I <clears throat> I think I think everyone loved hearing you talk, and I want to tell you how much I appreciate you doing that. Being sick and all, thanks for being my my third interview victim. I don't know how well these interviews are going to go, but this was well, extremely interesting and you're a great storyteller. Well, Cal, I can tell you the way you did the first time I heard you, you telling the story, you you do a good job of the narration, do a great job picking the intro music because I'm Capricorn, middle Georgia raised person. And I love to hear anybody play a dobro or a slide guitar. So, but just keep up the good work. Don't change anything you're doing. I'll listen to you anytime you want, you want to talk. And I'll be glad to help you any way I can. I promise. Man, I appreciate you. Let's keep in touch. Thank you again. Listen, everybody, thanks for listening. I really appreciate you uh, listening this far. Eddie's been a great guest. Just very interesting. Great storyteller from my region of the uh, southern United States. And we kind of talk the same language. So it's, yes, real, it's real easy for me. So uh, that's going to wind it up for this video. I appreciate y'all listening. Thanks. Thanks.